Hello and welcome to Garrity Talks. My name is Lucia Ongai and I am the co-founder of Garrity Awards. Just like the award, this series will put in the spotlight some of the industry's true change makers with the aim to drive progress within the industry in a global scale. Today we have as a guest Rania Robinson, CEO and partner at Quiet Storm. Thanks for joining us, Rania, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Rania moved to the UK from Egypt at the age of three, starting school at age four, not speaking a word of English, sparked a lifelong passion and fascination with forming connection and meaningful communication. She has spent most of her career in non-traditional agencies, working for brands such as 3Mobile, Mercedes, Stella Artois, and Coca-Cola. And seven years ago, she joined Quiet Storm, bringing a 360 perspective and new energy to the agency and redressing the balance of female representation, where female creatives are now equal to male and 60% of the senior management team are women. Rania features in campaigns a list of the most influential industry figures. In 2020, she was shortlist for Creative Pool's top 100 influencers. And she's an active member of WACL, an organization whose purpose is to accelerate gender equality in the advertising industry, regular commentator for the BBC. And she has had a number of blogs published in the Huffington Post. And she was part of the executive jury for Garrity Awards last year. Uh, sorry, oh, that was a very long bio. <laughs> That's a lot of things, right? <laughs> so thanks for joining us and thanks for giving us some of your time. So let's go right to the questions. Uh, you, I read in an interview you wanted to be a hairdresser when you were a kid. So how did you end up working in advertising? And in the same in interview you said you did not have a conventional path into the industry. So can you tell us about that unconventional path? Yeah, so um, I grew up in, coming from somewhere like Egypt. Um, they've got a very, very strong focus on academic and professional uh, business businesses, really. You know, you grow up with, with parents who want you, they aspire to you being a doctor or a lawyer. And actually the creative industries and the arts are not really respected in the same way as, as kind of the more classic professions. So I grew up in a house full of academics who, you know, encouraged me, strongly encouraged me to sort of move more towards kind of classic academic subjects. And I ended up in an all girls grammar school, which was, you know, um, brilliant in many ways because I grew up never feeling like I couldn't achieve anything. It was a very empowered environment as a young woman. Um, you know, they'd supported strong kind of uh, subjects that were predominantly male or considered to be male, like the sciences. Um, they encouraged the women of, at the school, to, the young women at the school to, to take up, it was wise women, which was women in science education. And they would encourage us to sort of take subjects that we would normally be considered, would, would normally be considered quite male. So I loved the fact that I was in that environment. It was very empowering. I, I never ever felt, as a woman that I couldn't do anything. It was a female headmistress as well and some very capable and brilliant young women. Um, but, but actually now in hindsight, I recognize that that probably wasn't the right environment for me being more naturally a creative and more, have more of a creative leaning because it just didn't support the arts and creative subjects. It just didn't see them in the same light as, as these academic subjects and, and nor did my parents. So, <laughs> so I grew up just not really knowing that the creative world was even an option, even though I had a natural tendency towards creative. So, I mean, I guess for me, being a hairdresser, it was the only creative thing that I was exposed to, I guess, as a young woman living in Salisbury as well, which is kind of not known for its media center <laughs> or creativity. Although actually they had a fantastic theater, actually, to be fair, um, and brilliant arts, um, arts um, kind of center and stuff. So th there was, but I think the combination of not going to a school that supported the arts and having a family background that didn't support the arts, it just was never an option for me. So, but obviously I'd go to the hairdressers and they'd be really kind of creative and funky. And it was a, a way of sort of, um, you know, it was an art, for me, it felt like an art form, um, cutting hair. So, but my mum put a complete dampener on that. She was horrified when I told her I wanted to be a hairdresser. And so I never really kind of fully pursued it, but what, it, what, what did happen was I felt very disengaged with school. So I didn't, I didn't do everything that my parents wanted me to do, which was, you know, get brilliant 
qualifications at school, go on and do a brilliant academic degree. And, and I actually dropped out of school at 16 because it just wasn't the right environment for me and I wasn't inspired. And, I, and it took me a long time to figure out what I wanted to do because I just didn't have any role models or any sort of idea. In London, well, I say London, you know, I used to watch the ads and I loved the ads. I used to be, like recite them when I was a kid and my mum would say to me, oh God, if only you could learn your lessons, like you learn these ads, you know, you'd be doing much better at school. <laughs> um, but it was like another world. It felt like it was like an alternate universe where this stuff happened. It just didn't feel like it was somewhere that I had access to. So um, eventually we moved to London when I was 16. My mum was an Arabic and Islamic teacher and obviously not much call cool for that in Salisbury. So she went to London to work at a private um, school, uh, which um, King Fahad Academy in Acton. And that's when I realized that actually this is where it's all happening. It's all happening in London. Um, so I decided that I wanted to get into one of these industries, whether it was music or fashion or film or media or community, any sort of, sort of arts, media, communication industries. Um, but I didn't, the only pathway I felt mm -hmm you know, that I understood was, well, you know, at the time, everybody had secretaries, you know, every industry had secretaries. It's not the case so much now, but so I thought, okay, I'll get a secretarial course under my belt and then that way I can get into any industry I want. And that, that is pretty much kind of what happened really. So oh, okay. yeah, so that, that was it. So um, I was actually quite strategic about it, but it wasn't conventional. So uh, I started life off as a secretary and worked my way up through, through that. And what was was the the school you went to just girls or yeah, what girls? girls and boys? Yeah, so it was South uh -huh. Grammar School for girls, and it was a selective school, grammar school. So you had to pass an exam to get in, um, and it was considered, you know, the brightest, you know, young people would would end up in this school. But you know, uh, yeah, it, it wasn't necessarily the right environment. It's not the right environment for everybody. And I think now, in in hindsight, I kind of understand why. At the time, I didn't really. But it was very much rote learning and you know it, it was yeah not everything that sort of kills creativity i i <laughs> yeah so <laughs> well like, it was good that then you moved to london and you could uh, discover and do it yourself yes <laughs> yeah and I, and I just yeah and i just i worked very hard i kind of made myself indispensable to the right people and was lucky enough to be given opportunities by people that you know have been instrumental throughout my career actually and people i really respect um, and yeah, and that, and that, and then kind of ended up where I, where I've ended up. And the, the first job as a secretary was in, in what, in, in an agency or what kind of a company? It took me a while to get into advertising and marketing. Ah. So I started off in music publishing. Um, as, and so I spent six months at a music publishing company being a very terrible secretary. I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> it was a time when they had typewriters, so they didn't even oh. have computers then. So if you made a mistake, you had to use Tipex. Yeah, over again also. yeah and I made a lot of mistakes so um yeah you'd, I'd end up with a lot of tipex on on my letter so I was pretty rubbish at that but I went very quickly from there to a company called Virgin Vision which was one of Richard Branson's first Ooh. businesses actually and it was video distribution so at the time it was VHS videos but it would so they would supply films to the likes of HMV and blockbuster business organizations brands that barely exists now but um yeah so I worked in the admin department and it was there that I had my first exposure to marketing so I was in sales and sorry I was not admin I was in sales and marketing uh, but I was more on the sales side and I did an admin role and I'd watch the marketing guys and see what they were doing and think actually that's more interesting that's what I want to be doing and it was at that point that I thought right I want to get into marketing what I didn't realize at the time was the difference between brand marketing brand side versus agency marketing I just thought right I want to work in marketing so I went to a, a, a recruitment agent and I said I want a job in a marketing company and actually they sent me to an agency which you know at the time I didn't really know the difference um, and I went in as a secretary at this agency it was a small independent agency that, that's now a very big uh, agency and actually I've spent a lot of my career in small independent businesses that have become big businesses and they've ended up being mm. sold. Um, and actually, yeah, it was there that I got my first experience. And I used to type up the, the presentations and all the proposals that the guys would, would develop. And I was like, I used to love, I used to get so excited by the ideas. And it was at that point that I was like, this is it. This I've kind of found my thing. Um, yeah, and, and, and that's really, I, I, I kind of 
that was the start of my marketing advertising career. Okay. And uh, you also mentioned, I've always been quite instinctive and done what felt right in that moment. Did that intuition ever betray you and something did not come out as much as you wanted to? Yeah, I think to be honest with you, I think I've learned to think a little bit more about what I'm doing. I think sometimes you need to trust your gut. And I think in certain situations where you've got a lot of experience, you can trust your gut because it's not coming from nothing. It's coming from acquired knowledge over many, 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 many years. And actually I can be very instinctive when I sort of hear an idea that I think is right or, you know, a strategy that feels really right. And I think actually I've been doing this for over 25 years. So actually I can trust my instincts with things like that. But where I've made decisions where it's new territory, new ground for me, an area where I've got less experience or less knowledge, I think I've learned I've had to, you've got to do your research and you've got to think of through it a little bit more because you don't have all that kind of historic knowledge that you can rely on to allow you to just trust your gut. Um, so no, I, I'm now trying to figure out, I, I now think through a little bit more whether it, it, I need more consideration around a decision and more inputs as well. And and more. You realize that right away? No. Like, I should ask someone about this or maybe you think a little bit and then you decide it's better to ask somebody to help you. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. I think I think I've made enough mistakes over the years. <laughs> where I've been a bit impulsive and I've made bad decisions. If I was to be honest with you, and I've been very lucky that none of those decisions have been, you know, really detrimental. But they've been, you know, they've they've definitely been disruptive and caused problems. So I, I think I've made enough mistakes to now go. Okay, in that area, I probably need to get some advice, or I need to do some reading, or I need some background knowledge, or I need to sleep on it maybe or just let it simmer for a while and that's not I'm a very impulsive person as well so that doesn't come naturally to me I have to really stop myself sometimes um, from from making an impulsive decision okay <laughs> and um quiet storm no sorry last year quiet storm celebrated its 25th anniversary and in November moved to an employee ownership trust model following other agencies can you tell us how this model works and why you chose it and yeah. what your expectations are? Yeah, so Trevor, oh, oh, so I'm gonna have some drilling going on. Just a second, shall I, uh, yeah, oh, hopefully it's gonna stop. Right, um, so I, so Trevor founded the business 25 years ago and you know, most people found, I mean, he didn't necessarily originally found the agency with a view to building it up and then selling it and making a ton of money. I mean, you know, I think he built it, he set it up because he wanted to work in a very different kind of way. Um, so it was never really about, you know, that classic entrepreneurial kind of approach where you go, I see a gap in the market, I see a business opportunity, I see, you know, a kind of long-term commercial kind of um, opportunity. It was always from the heart and from the gut. It was, you know, allowing him to work in a way that he wanted to work and to have a culture that he really wanted. And that has really stayed very true to the business throughout particularly, you know, also throughout his, you know, the, the time he's been running the business and since he set it up. And certainly when I came into the business, you know, Trevor and I share very similar values. We're married, you know, there's a lot of kind of consistency in terms of how we think and, and the things that are important to us and matter to us. To us. And for, for me, that, that original kind of vision never changed. It was about working in a way that we wanted to work. It was never about making as much money as we could possibly make and getting out and doing it again, which lots of people do. But so that, that's why the EOT appealed to us so much because, you know, you, when you've been running a business a long time, and actually I've been with business, sorry, I've actually been with the business almost nine years now, is you do get to a point where you go, well, you want to release some equity, you know, obviously you don't work, you know, you don't, sort of, you, you, you want to sort of reap the benefits of building a business up over, over the years. But the, equally, you want to see that it's like its legacy continues and you want to see that the culture doesn't change. And actually, that's very hard mm. in a classic traditional sale. You know, I've been in businesses that have been small, great, independent, brilliantly, you know, fantastic culture, great creative agencies. And I've seen them change as they've got bigger and I've seen them change as once they've been bought. So I've seen that firsthand, as has Trev. You know, Trevor was at How Henry in its heyday. And he was there when, when the business got sold and, and saw what happened to the business when it was sold. So neither of us really wanted that, but equally we wanted to, you know, release some equity and, and benefit from, from the hard work that we've both been putting into the agency. So this way for us, it was a win-win all round. Because also the other thing is it really 
impact your clients as well. Mm. You know, we've done, we've gone through a sale before, um, you know, and actually you see the impact it has across the business as well. And not all your clients, they choose you for a reason. They want to work with you for a reason. And actually it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily what they want either. If you suddenly get into a different structure and the way you work changes and, you know, um, your ability to be agile or to be bespoke, um, all the things that come with being an independent agency. So for us, what was good about the EOT is what ends up happening is you, you kind of technically sell the business to the business. So it goes into a trust. So the shareholders get paid back over a you know, number of years, partly from retained profit that, that's been accrued over a number of years, but also through future profits. And what ends up happening is the, the shareholding sits in a trust and that, the shareholders get paid back. But then over time, what happens is the staff become the beneficiaries of any future profits once the shareholders have been paid back. So they're not technically shareholders. So if they leave, they don't walk out with shares. But whilst they're there, they benefit in the way the shareholders would benefit from profits. So actually what you're doing is putting the money back into the people who are basically growing your business and you know working hard and, and driving the business, business's success. So what that also means is as owners um, or ex-shareholders, there's no kind of reason for us to exit. There's, we continue you know, to run the business with more employee input. So they get more involved in major business decisions because they are obviously uh, the beneficiaries. So they have a say in big decisions, life, you know, work life-changing decisions or things that might impact on future profits. Um, so yeah, but you, but you retain the culture, you retain the values um, and the staff benefit rather than you know, a, a big network agency that, you know, and, you know, or, or an IPO'd business or a you know, private equity or VC that doesn't really have that same emotional connection to the business mm. that our staff do. And so it's got like a win-win all round for everybody, really. Yeah, it sounds like that. And how is it working with your husband? Well, that's interesting. <laughs> that may, that is, it, it can be very tense at times, as you can imagine, because obviously you don't get away from it. You don't get away from the business. Um, you have brutally honest conversations mm. in a way that you wouldn't have probably with anyone else. Um, but it, it's good in the sense that it keeps us real. It keeps us grounded because we'll, you know, we'll pull each other up on things that, you know, maybe nobody else might feel comfortable. Mm. We're brutally honest. Um, at the same time, you need to kind of find the discipline to kind of separate work yeah. from person. Well, I can imagine. yeah it's it's Trevor's much better at that than me I think maybe because he's a creative like a pure play true and true creative he needs to make sure he has kind of capacity and he's very good at separating things actually a lot of things um much better than I am <laughs> um so it sort of forced me to become more disciplined about knowing where the boundaries are um yeah, because, you know, if it was down to me, I'd probably be, you know, it'd be 24-7, probably. <laughs> He's not like that, and it's good. It keeps me, it keeps, keeps me, it stops me from doing that. But yeah, you have to work on it. And also, Quiet Storm has brought back in 2020 the Create Not Hate program, uh, initially launched in, 20, in 2007. Can you tell us about the program and why was it a good moment to bring it back? Yeah, so Trevor launched it in 2007. Um, and it was really off the back of his desire to bring more people into the industry from his background. I mean, his feeling was he's had a really fantastic career in the advertising industry um, and he wanted other people to experience that, particularly people he grew up with and, and the types of people that he grew up with, because he recognized at the time when he was growing up, there was all these brilliantly talented people that he, he grew up with that didn't even know about advertising, or if they did know about it, a bit like me really, didn't think it was for them or didn't think it was a world that they had access to. Um, so he wanted to change that. And, and he was also recognizing that the industry was becoming very homogenous, you know, mm. lots of the same types of people thinking in the same way, coming from the same universities, coming from the same sort of backgrounds. And he felt the industry was really missing out on this really fresh, talent that just would think in a very different way. So what prompted him at, specifically was um, a kid from his old school got stabbed and he wanted to go back and 
address will tackle the issues of gun and knife crime but with the people that kind of live it and experience it every day I think you know often we have people sort of developing these campaigns that have no real real understanding real world real life understanding of the issues so he felt like it was a really good opportunity to one sort of try and help these young people unlock their creative potential you know be aware of advertising get some experience with it whilst also tackling this, this very important issue. So he went back to his old school, he set a brief, which was, okay, how would you tackle gun and knife crime? And the idea was that the best idea got made and, and Quiet Storm made the idea. It ended up being a beautiful short film written by two young uh, kids from the school who actually knew the boy that got stabbed. And, we, and, and he made it and, um, and we got all the community involved. So we got kids from the school, kids from the local estate. They were, you know, directing or styling or running or cast, you know, acting. So we had almost 200 young people involved in this program. And what they, what they got was an experience end to end of, of what the, the kind of advertising experience is. So the idea was after doing that, that we would, can, we would get people in the industry to adopt the program and all run their own versions of it. Because at the time we were funding it as an agency and that's kind of unsustainable as you can imagine, you know, you know when you're trying to sort of run a business. Um, so, sorry. <laughs> um, so, um, so, that, so that didn't kind of really quite take off in the way that we'd hoped it would. And, and also if you think about it, 2007, that was like 13 years ago. It was, so after the murder of George Floyd um, last year, we both felt a really, well, it brought up a lot of emotions and feelings in Trevor, as you can imagine, as it did with a lot of the black community. And we both felt a real sense of kind of responsibility to do something. And I, like, like many people have. Um, so we felt that bringing back Create Not Hate for us was something that we could do that was very active, that was very tangible. Um, so that, that's really what inspired us to do that. And particularly with Notting Hill Carnival coming up in the summer, and we knew it wasn't gonna happen in the way that it normally does, yeah. obviously because of COVID. Yeah. And actually, I think a lot of people don't realize they go to Carnival and you know, everyone sort of knows Notting Hill Carnival, but not everyone necessarily knows the history of Notting Hill Carnival and actually why it was set up all those years ago. And it was very much in line, kind of really in line with the kind of stuff that, that's been happening even now, that's still happening even now, uh, where black people are being killed. Um, so that was why Notting Hill Carnival was originally um, started way back, I think it was in the 50s. Um, and, um, 50s I think it was the 50s and um, so we wanted to basically use that moment in time to support you know the black community and support the the issues and kind of put a spotlight on the issues so the brief this time around was anti-racism and we engaged again young people who live with this every single day who experience racism on a daily basis um, and developed a campaign that was designed really to educate people and try and give them a, a real understanding of what these, these black people, you know, black community are experiencing. So that was the, the main reason for launching that. And the work we were so, I mean, I was so amazed with the quality of the work that came out of these young people who have had really no experience of advertising whatsoever. It was their first experience of it. And they were coming up with ideas that were so incredibly powerful. Um, and actually we, you know, we got lots of kind of support and accolades for it um, and for us it was a real testament to the creative potential that's out there that our industry is not utilizing mm. and did, did you have to change your plans a lot because of uh, the pandemic or it didn't really affect well it made it a little bit more challenging in mm. all honesty because obviously i mean it was very important for us to do these sessions face to face because these are young people they're not necessarily that engaged with it initially you know you've got a bit of a job to kind of get them inspired and engaged with the process and you know for some of these young people they don't have access necessarily the right access for online and and it's not really the best way to to engage them so for us it was important that we did the sessions face to face um and then obviously we've been producing stuff and pitching and doing everything really virtually for the last year now almost so that really wasn't the issue for us what was really important was that we could get time face-to-face -face time with the young people mm -hmm. and we were able to do that obviously you know in a way that was covid safe um so that was the main thing for us but yeah it put a lot it did put extra pressure on the teams 
Um, yeah. Again, we will be able to go back to that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Getting face to face, which is it's not the same. And uh, one of your most iconic campaigns that has been running for some years now is for Harry Bo, the kids' yes. voice with ads. How, how did you come up with the idea for this campaign? Oh God, well, I mean, I can't take the credit for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it was actually the original idea, it's quite a few years old now, I think the first one was that we launched was back in 2014 or something, it's been running for a really long time in the UK, so the original, so it was it was a lady called Mary Sue and Trevor, Trevor who uh, developed the idea together, and actually, I think with any creative process and creative idea, I mean, this is what I kind of, you, you see with 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 creatives that they're like sponges they just absorb <laughs> so much stuff and so much stimulus and and I, I I think you know often these ideas are inspired by you know a piece of stimulus of some sort but I think it does also really help when you've got a very very grounded and solid strategy so the strategy really was about this childlike happiness that you get with Haribo and actually you know it doesn't matter if you're a grown-up or if you're a child and we see it in the office you open a bag of Haribo and everyone's just like you see all the the child in them come out when they get excited about you know the sweets and so for us that the strategy of this sort of bringing out you know your inner child if you like was such a strong clear focused strategy that actually coming up with an idea off that you know, it's not easy, it's never easy, and it's never easy coming up with a brilliant idea that's really like, as you know, it's got the kind of level of popularity that that, that has, because it's not just in the UK, that ad has been, you know, either produced by us or other markets. In Germany as well, I read. Yeah, it's like 17 markets, and it's performing oh, okay. in every, yeah, 17 markets now, from Japan to France to the UK, so really culturally very, very different countries as well, but yet this idea, has just trans translated and transcended every single market because it, there's such a basic human insight. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you just wanna lift off all the pressures of adulthood and all the stresses and strains and have that kind of freedom and liberation and happiness that you had as a child. Um, so it's a very, very emotive strategy. And I think because it's such a very clear strategy, I think it, it did make it probably a bit easier for the guys to come up with something that was so, um, powerful because it comes from such a strong human emotional insight so yeah and it's it's been incredibly popular um yeah across i the am world. a big harry Wolf fan so i totally understand <laughs> <laughs> i like choosing uh, the, the bears are my favorites and i love choosing the color <laughs> everybody's got a favorite mine, mine are the little men um yeah but that's i mean that's that's the truth of it is again it's it all comes from a really really strong insight and that's very universal as well. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. Yeah. And uh, what campaigns or projects are you currently working for that you can tell us about? Well, we've got a couple of things that are at the moment confidential that we can't talk about um, at the moment, I'm afraid. But there's one really particularly exciting piece of work that we're working on at the moment, which we'll hopefully get to announce really soon. And for us, it's just, it's, and it's, it's an amazing, kind of opportunity because it sort of plays to both of our loves as a, as a business, I guess. One, which is, you know, commercial growth for businesses. I mean, we, we do what we do to drive commercial growth. It's about selling stuff, but equally it's got a really strong, positive social component to it as well. And it's about helping drive, you know, pos pos positive social outcomes in the world as well. And certainly, you know, so for us, that's our perfect blend of campaign where you can, you know, help drive commercial growth, but also do some good in the world. Um, so that's that's coming soon. I'm sorry, I can't tell you what it is. No, no, um, okay. but oh, it'll it'll be announced very soon, and it'll be obvious um, what what I'm talking about. But um, we've also just started. We've got a new campaign coming out for Zaflora in March, which I'm really proud of as well. It's a very it's a very beautiful piece of film actually, and it's probably quite different to what people are used to seeing from us because. Um, you know, it, it's very bold and very distinctive, um, but but in a very different kind of way to 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 the kind of stuff that we normally do. So, and it looks stunning and it's very beautifully produced. So, um, yeah, looking forward to that coming out in. And then we've also got new Vimto campaign coming out next year as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so yeah. So you've been busy. 
<laughs> we've been very busy. God, we've been really busy. I'm so thankful for it, actually, to be honest with you, because I know that's not been the case for everybody. Mm. But we've been incredibly lucky in that we've got a good portfolio of, account, of accounts. We've got a lot of food and drink, and they've obviously been doing quite well through all mm. of this. We've got home entertainment brands on our roster as well. And, yeah, and we've just been... Yeah, we've been producing stuff and pitching and, and doing all the things that you would normally do. So, no, I'm very pleased to say that we have been busy, thankfully. That's great. Yeah. And uh, among the things you mentioned in an article that you learned in the very particular 2020 year that you had, were that you need to stick to your values, hold your nerve as a business leader and keep your business model lean. What would you like 2021 to teach you and what would you like to be surprised by in the industry or the world in general this year? Um, I really hope that we don't, I mean, who knows what's going to happen next? I mean, you know, that you're getting all these mixed kind of reviews, aren't you, on what, are we going into the roaring 20s? Are we going into really challenging economic kind of decline? And actually, in reality, it's going to be a bit of both and some people are going to experience you know, the roaring 20s and some are going to experience very, very tough economic challenges. And I think for me, what I really hope is that we don't lose sight of actually what's important and, mm. and where we need to invest, even because it's at tough times that you really are put to the test in a way, your values are put to the test, your kind of um, principles are put, put to the test. And I think what I hope is that brands don't stop investing in creativity and they don't stop investing in brand because actually those things do really matter even when things are, time times are really tough so I, I think um yeah I think for me I, I'd like to see that kind of continued trajectory around purpose and doing good and you know behaving correctly and in the right kind of way in terms of how you treat your staff how you treat the planet how you treat um your customers so yeah but it, it can be challenging when, when times are tough um, for businesses to, to stay their course, which is why for me, the hold your nerve bit and staying true to your values is really important is because it's, it's when times are tough that, that, that you are more likely to throw away some of those principles, but it's the wrong thing to do. Okay. Well, that sounds very promising. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time and thanks for sharing all your experience with us and hope you have a great year. Fantastic, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much.